Ladies gentlemen, we've been over the rules. Protect yourself at all times. I'm on the fence. I'm on the fence. We don't need to talk about we, 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 we. Left hook from Yaounde came and landed on him, you know, so... Hey, welcome back to the King's Court MMA. Uh, we're back with episode five of the King's Court Meet. Uh, we are here with professional MMA fighter John Salter. John, you are uh, got some record, really, and I think I should do the introduction properly. You know, you're a professional fighter with 25 professional fights under your belt, a record of 19 and 6. 17 of those wins have been via finish, 10 submissions, 7 KOs, fought in a lot of different uh, big organizations like Bellator, Strike Force, UFC a black belt in uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu and also the owner of Salty Dog uh, Gym MMA. John, welcome. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing today? I'm, I'm very well, sir. I'm very well. Uh, I hope I didn't miss anything out in that introduction. But uh... Oh, that was fantastic. I appreciate you. You made me sound better than I am. <laughs> no, I think the modesty is on your part, sir. Definitely. Um, I know we, we first spoke actually on the, the pre-fight press conference for, for Bellator. Um, you are the latest fight, really, at Bellator 293. Um, and I want to really start by congratulating you on, on what a great performance that was. Um, well, again. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, um, it was, uh, wasn't the most exciting uh, of fights. You know, I kind of, when I go out there um, and I see what somebody's good at, Aaron Jeffrey, every time he fights a really good college wrestler, he is very good at getting up. So and I looked at how he got up. I tried to take that away and then force them to start making mistakes. And Aaron uh, was is a smart fighter. When I took away what he wanted to do, he just kind of held on to where he was. He didn't go to a backup plan that would put him in a bad position. So it just kind of led to um, almost like a chess match. You know, I'm taking away what you want. And he was kind of went with the wall, wait till you stop taking it away. And so it turned into not being the most exciting of fights and not giving a finish. But, um, you know, he's a tough guy and fights smart. So um, I just had to be happy to come out there with the win. No, no definitely. And we, we know you like finishes. That's that's what you do if you look back at your whole career. You've been, you've been finishing people. So sometimes these these matches that are like chess matches are, are things that, you you know, you need to you need to get done. Um, and, you know, Aaron's a real stud. He was coming off a three-fight winning streak. Obviously, that KO off of Austin Vanderford as well. Um, I, I asked you in the pre-fight press conference um, that did you think Aaron was overlooking you or looking past you? And, and you said specifically, um, I don't think so. He's just a confident guy looking to crown the rankings. If I was to ask you that again, do you think that was the case? Or do you think that you were just able just to impose your will at, at any time, really? I think the only thing that, uh, and this is just talking to people after the fight who have trained with him, I think he was so confident in his ability to not get taken down and not be able to be held down that I think he just thought, well, if he does take me down, I'm going to pop right back up. He won't be able to take me down again. And, you know, I talked to him after. I think his mind was kind of blown that I took him down. But I don't think it was arrogance or anything like that. I think the he's a very hard guy to take down. And you've got to find a way. You know, I had to um, find a couple of different ways to do it, um, luckily. I've you know got a few different options there, but I think you know if he, even when he goes against really good stri- uh, wrestlers, I think it was perfect example. Um, and oh my gosh, now uh, Andre uh, is it Petrov? I think um, I'm probably saying it completely wrong that uh, he TK TKO'd, and I may have the completely wrong person. I'm terrible at remembering what's going on in MMA, but uh, I know he fought a really good Division One wrestler. Uh, the guy took him down a couple times, and he popped back up and gassed the guy out guy couldn't take him down anymore and aaron just kind of uh took over the fight you know in the second round from that so i think he kind of thought that was the way it was going to go and i think it shocked him when i had a game plan to shut off shut down his ability to get up you know and that's the new thing that guys do super hard for wrestlers uh to deal with they go to an elbow they pop up on a hand go to the other hand walk to the cage and start climbing up and uh, that is so hard to deal with because everything in my mind as a wrestler is telling me, keep the hits heavy, hug him, hold him down. And that just doesn't work with that. You know, and I think um, he's probably dealt with a lot of wrestlers where he trains, he trains at one of the best gyms in the world. So he gets all these really good wrestlers and they're not able to hold him down. You know, so I think he thought that I wasn't going to have the answer. But, you know, the fact that, you know, I've been a black belt in jiu-jitsu for what, 10 years now, um, you know, and uh, 
and the guys that I have to train with. And I've got a guy, Corey Crumpler. He is a world-class black belt. He just doesn't like to compete. He's 3-0 and in MMA and just decided he didn't want to fight anymore. But I have him to sit there and we, we break down, okay, this guy does this and Corey's so good, he can emulate it. And then we can just play with it until I figure out how to beat it, you know? And um, so that's kind of what I was able to do for Aaron. And I just think he didn't go into the fight with the uh, mentality of I might get stopped. I need a plan B, you know, and that's a learning lesson for him. He's a younger guy, you know, so he, he's going to learn from that and get better. No, indeed. I like I like the take that you have on it. And I think you've been given a learning lessons to quite a few guys on the on the up in <laughs> your career, like some Costello, like some Chitty. It's. It seems to be a recurring theme with yourself. <laughs> well, like I said, the, you know, everybody's got to have their good training partners, and I've got so many. So, I mean, you know, if I just try to go through all uh, training partners, there's a bunch of people you've heard of, you know, Joe Selecki, Chris Weidman, Chris Honeycutt, Tom Lane, uh, Brian Barbarina, you know, I, um, Jamie Pickett, all these guys that are in big organizations that are just great training partners, you know. But uh, Corey Crumper, like I said, he's the best training partner I've ever had. And he doesn't want to fight, so he's just here to help me, you know. And uh, and he can simulate what so many people do, so it's really helped my career. Like, a uh, perfect example, Chitty, you know, and Jaquani, the fastest guy I've ever fought, hands down, you know. Um, just unbelievable speed. And, uh, and I knew, you know, I've got a few friends that trained with him in the past that I wrestled with. And they didn't say anything. They were friends with him, friends with me, so like, you can't say anything. All they would say, you know, was, um, this is going to be a tough one, you know, and uh, to have somebody like Corey that can try to simulate everything Chitty does. He's got crazy speed, you know, and everything. So when we go into the fight, I don't think anything can get you ready for Chitty's hand speed. But Corey had me ready for Chitty's uh, speed on his feet, you know, and moving around, cutting angles, all that. Um, now, I will say when Chitty jabbed me the first time and I reacted as his hand was coming back to his face, I realized that oh, man, this this guy's got a different level of speed with his hands. But, you know, just to have a guy like Corey to get me ready for stuff like that has been uh, – it's the game changer in my career, you know? Yeah. Yeah, fair play. Fair play. And, and after, obviously, the 293, you did announce your, your retirement, which might have been a shock mm -hmm. to most of us, a shock to myself as well. Uh, did you know that you were going to retire after that fight, or was it dependent on the win? No, I knew uh, I was going to go out after that. Um, I had last summer, I was I had a good hard training session uh, at the beginning of the summer um, and went was mopping the mats afterwards, and my back just kind of locked up on me where I couldn't hardly walk. I couldn't really do anything. I couldn't sleep. Um, and, you know, you think, like, okay, well, this is going to last, what, a week, maybe two weeks? It lasted months. And um, I got to the point I couldn't hardly grapple. I could just hit pads, you know. Um, and it, it was miserable for months. And uh, anyway, I, I had to turn down a couple of fights because of it. And, you know, I, that just kind of let me know. I am in my late 30s. Uh, I'm 38 now, you know. Um, and I just knew, like, uh, it's it's got to come. I got to end soon. Um, I got nothing but tough guys to fight. They gave me Aaron Jeffries. And uh, that was one where I took it. If I can beat him, I go out on a big win. If I can't beat him, I'm not at my peak anymore, so I need to be done anyway, you know. And, um, you know, I got healthy for that fight. And, uh, you know, right now I'm healthy. I feel great. I'm sparring all the time, helping these guys get ready. But I know that next injury is coming, and uh, it's just nice to be able to say, okay, I'm not worried about can I stay healthy for another fight. I'm just trying to help guys get ready, you know. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a smart way to look at it, to know when actually your time is, not your time is up per se, but when your time is, the transition is ready, really. It's about time. Uh -huh. No, no kudos on that. Um, and again, I'm, I'm a fight fan, you know, um, the fight fans at 293. And May fans can be quite fickle sometimes. And oh, apolo yeah. Apologies for the, for the reaction that you got. Oh, I don't think it was a reaction to you retiring. I think it was just a reaction to what they thought of the fight really and truly but you did handle it like a boss what how did you feel after that well you know I mean, it, it doesn't bother me and like my wife obviously gets very upset about it but it doesn't bother me because like i was telling her in the locker room i was like the same people that are out there booing when we walk out of this arena are going to shake my hand they're going to want to take a picture with me they're going to tell me congratulations like, it's just people they're drinking they're having a good time it's just what you do 
you know, somebody else is going boo next to you, like, oh, I'm going to jump in on that, you know? Yeah. And uh, and that exact thing, ha- thing happened. You know, we, we get out, and as we walk out, people are shaking my hands, taking pictures with me, all kinds of stuff, you know? And the other thing is, you know, now that uh, some of the people are gambling on uh, MMA, I said, you know, you take a guy like Aaron Jeffrey, who's a four-to-one favorite, everybody's putting him in their parlay, you know? So um, me beating him screws up a lot of people's nights, so people aren't happy about it, you know? And um, that's just the way it is. And um, I told her, I said, we can't, uh, we just don't check Instagram messages um, for about a week, and we go through and delete them. And uh, so uh, we I opened one and showed her, and she goes, yep, delete all this. So I just went through and delete, 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 you know. But um, it doesn't bother me. Um, you know, you got people that um, that are doing it just as a joke. You got, you know, you got all kinds of stuff going on. But, um, you know, when you're fighting a really tough guy, you want every fight to be exciting. I want to finish every fight I can. I wish I had the power to knock people out all the time. I just don't. Um, but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you're there to get a win and get paid. And that's what I had to do. Fair play, fair play. And, and I've said this before, you've had such a fantastic career, obviously 1996 across multiple different promotions, obviously Bellator, Scrap Force, UFC. When you look back at your achievements, what, what are the emotions that, that come out from it? Um, you know, obviously I would love to get the Bellator title. You know, I think that's the one goal in my career that I didn't get. You know, I got my shot. Bellator was uh, great. They gave me my shot. I just didn't have what it took that night against Masasi. But other than that, you know, um, I kind of uh, look back at everything. And uh, I guess, you know, like I won a state championship in high school. And in my mind, like at the time, like, okay, what a, what a like great point. I'm so excited. You know, that's uh, hitting the top. And then by the time I'm wrestling in college, you know, it's like uh, I'm beating three or four state champs every weekend, you know, because we're in college. Everybody's a state champ, you know. And um, so then it kind of, you know, it starts making that accomplishment feel like it wasn't as much, you know. And then I got went on, I won a national title in college. And I think, okay, this is the pinnacle. It doesn't get better than this, you know. And then you get in MMA, and I'm fighting guys like, uh, you know, multiple All-American wrestlers, you know, um, training with uh, national champs and All-Americans all the time. And it kind of gets to the point, like, well, now I'm not worried about that accomplishment. i got to get to the next one, you know. And in your career, it just kind of becomes moving on to the next thing all the time. But now looking back and being able to appreciate um, the places I've been, the wins and this most importantly going out on a win over a legit opponent you know it just makes it so much better because uh you know in my mind for a long time i thought when it's time for me to retire i'm going to call and i'm going to ask for somebody that's a good favorable matchup for me to try and go out on a win somebody that i can submit you know so but i just think it um means so much more to go out on a win over a guy like aaron because he's just such a tough guy and I'm going to get to watch him go on and win fights, you know. And like like right now, I get to go and watch uh, Chitty make his run in the UFC, you know. I get to watch uh, Dustin Jacoby go on his tear in the UFC, you know. And uh, it's just stuff. And I expect to see some major things out of Costello in the future, you know. It's just nice to uh, be able to sit back, walk, you know, and say, okay, I'm the old guy now, but uh, look what these guys are doing, you know. Nice. And, and talking about, again, you, your career as a, as a whole, you, you've been on some mega cards as well. I think the Strike Force show that you did had the likes of uh, Daniel Cormier, Aman Nunez on, um, OSP, uh, Tyra Woodley. For you, what was your favorite card that you had to fight on? I got I to gotta, uh, talk about uh, OSP. OSP is a good guy. I like him. We've been uh, friends a long time. He stole my spot on that card. I was supposed to be on the main card, and I was supposed to be fighting Yancey Madero. And uh, Yancey Madero pulled out with, like, three weeks' notice, and uh, Strike Force said, we can't find you anybody. And me and OSP were training together, getting ready for that fight, and then they bumped him to the main card and bumped me to the undercard. And I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> and uh, so then I ended up fighting a guy, um, uh, like a 3-0 guy out of Indiana, but he didn't have any, uh, like, real – credentials or anything so i beat him in like two minutes but then uh strike force didn't keep me because uh because i wasn't on the main card and i, I was, uh always you know joke around but osp stole my uh my my limelight there but um 
he's he's a great guy. I love watching his career. We've trained together a good bit. But um, as far as I would say, you know, the highlights uh, or my probably my favorite card I've ever fought on, and I took it on short notice is the Chidi and Jaquani card, and we got to be the main event. But it was so undeserved. If you look at the people that were on that card, you know, it's just uh, it was amazing. But there were people on the undercard that night that I'm fans of, you know, um, my buddy, uh, Chris Barnheiser, he wrestled at uh, Indiana University. And then that guy, Corey Crumpler, like I said, he's he's a wrestler. And we're looking at the undercard and we're looking at um, Sean Bunch is on the undercard. You know, you're talking about a guy that's uh, been on the Olympic ladder for years. And I actually wrestled with his brother in college. And um, then you just go down the list of the undercard, and it's all these like, stud wrestlers that we've been following for so long. And <laughs> we're sitting up on the main event, and we're getting ready to, like, hey, guys, it's time to go watch the undercard. You know, and we went and sat in the stands and watched the undercard um, just because it was such an amazing uh, undercard. And then we had to go back to the hotel to get picked up to come for my fight. So when the undercard ended, that's like, all right, now we got to go back to the hotel, you know. Um, that was just a, uh, such a cool event. So many guys fighting on it that I've always thought were just, um, uh, the pinnacle of the sport of wrestling and getting into MMA and watching them do that. And, um, it was a card that if I wasn't a part of, I was going to want to watch, you know, and then I was the main event on it. So it was, it was such a cool experience, but looking back, I almost felt bad when we we shouldn't be the main event on this. These guys should be the main event, you know? Um, but that was a cool one. That, that one was really awesome. Nice. Nice. That's a nice one to hear. Um, and I go on to, to favorite fight. But my favorite fight was was the Brandon Halsey fight. Um, uh-huh. I think from a spectator's point of view, <laughs> that was quite exciting. Um, but what would you say your favorite fight was? That one probably was uh, my favorite. You know, the excitement of it. But when... Uh, <clears throat> When I knew that I was going to be going to Bellator, I hadn't signed with Bellator yet, but we kind of talked a little bit and knew that it was coming. Um, Halsey was the champ. And, you know, I just remember watching Halsey, and I'm like, I, I can beat that guy nine out of ten times, you know. And uh, so I got to get signed to Bellator, and I got to win a couple fights, and I got to fight Halsey, you know. And I got, uh, I got signed, but my wife and I had already – made plans we were leaving uh california and moving to north carolina so i'm giving you a long story you probably don't want all this but i'm going to give you the long story of this um and so i get to fight with dustin jacoby well my wife already had to move to north carolina because she was starting out here with her job and it was for the same company but it was a new position mm-hmm. and uh so i had to stay in california for three weeks finish up my camp and go fight so i fight him we move and we get out here well, I was, uh, I had income I was making in North or in California outside of fighting. And we got here and I started thinking, you know, I, I need something else. I, I got to have something else to do. I got to have something else that's bringing in income other than fighting. So um, I, I uh, ended up getting on the fire department. And my mentality was at the fire department, I can train while I'm there. I can train in my off time and everything, you know. So it's going to be great. Um, but we had to go through the academy. So I had to turn down a couple of fights while we were in, the, in going through the academy. And then uh, I get out and I text my manager. I'm like, hey, I'm good to go. I'm ready to fight. Um, and they give me palsy. So I couldn't have been more pumped about it. Yeah. Well, I didn't realize how little we were going to sleep through uh, while I was at the fire department. getting calls all night long, so I wasn't sleeping. And then they uh, got kind of strict on not wanting me to train while I was at work because I had a buddy that would bring some mats and we'd drill jujitsu. I had another buddy that would come hold pads for me while we weren't going on calls. And then I thought, well, I can lift and do my cardio. Well, they didn't really like me lifting uh, on my own. They didn't really like me doing my cardio on, on my own. They didn't like me getting those guys to come in and work out with me. Um, and so my wife was like, you guys, you got to tell them you're quitting right now. She's like, this fight is more important than that. Like I, you know, she's like, we didn't do all this sacrificing for you to be in the fire department, we do all the sacrificing for you to win fights, you know? And I said, well, I agree with that, said, but I have committed to this. And I was like, I'm going to do it through this fight because I don't like to back down. You know, I don't, I don't like to back out of commitments. If I tell you I'm going to do something, I want to do it, you know? And so I was like, I'm going to go through this fight camp um, while I'm in the fire department because I said, I'm going to do it. I told these guys I'm going to do it. Um, I was like, when this fight's over, then we'll talk about, you know, I, I got to step away. I can't keep going. 
So um, all of that was kind of a, a lot all in one because going to fight, like if I can win this fight with the way that I've had to go through this camp, I hadn't been able to train the way I wanted. I haven't got the sleep and the rest that, you know, uh, you want in the fight camp. Um, Cause if I can win this fight going through that, then I know that I'm in a good spot, you know? And so going out there and getting that first round finish um, was just uh, an amazing experience because <clears throat> all that saying, you know, I know that I'm not what I, I wasn't the level I could have been for that fight and to go out there and get that win, you know? And uh, I remember my last training session uh, before that fight, I got off shift and I went and met my buddy and, uh, I was like, you know, I really like when people slip a lot. It's like, I think when he gets tired, he's going to try and slip a bunch. And I was like, uh, I'll throw, uh, I'm going to faint my two and throw my head kick. And I was like, that'll probably be the second, third round. It's like, all right, that sounds good. Well, he comes out in the first round, he slipped, slipped, slipped. And uh, I was like, well, let me try it. And I landed it. And then I landed it two more times. But it's funny, I never drilled that uh, until the last session before that fight. And, um, so it's just funny that, that that was what, you know, is so memorable about that fight. He's landing that head kick, and we yeah. drilled it for one day. <laughs> that's, that's timing. That's divine. That, I, I love that. And a question, was any of that blood yours? I didn't think it was. So we, um, once, uh, right before the ref stopped, stepped in to stop it and look at his, he, we both came forward at the same time and hit heads. And you can't really tell in the video. Um, but it did cut me under my eye, but I was already so covered in his blood that, um, uh, you couldn't, it, I don't even know if it was bleeding or not. And, yeah. uh, so when the ref stepped in, to stop it and look at the cut, we had hit heads. So I, we hit so hard. I figured I was cut. I assumed it. Um, so I turned around and looked at my corner and I was like, Hey, cause the ref said, let me check that cut. I looked at them and I was like, that was from my head, but he did not hit me. And uh, our corner said, I, I know. So I thought, oh, no, they're going to try and check this. And he didn't hit me. Well, the ref had no idea I was cut because there was so much blood. So he's checking Halsey. And um, then uh, I cut him. The head kick cut him. But then he kept lunging in, and I kept hitting him with a right hook. And um, I was hitting him in the same spot on the other eye. So you couldn't even tell his. He was cut probably worse under his other eye because I hit him in the same spot so many times with that right hook. And, um, so after the fight, he was, uh, you know, one thing I, I, uh, very, you know, I'm very, uh, strong believer of Jesus Christ as my savior. So when, after a fight, you know, I just, it's my chance to talk to somebody and pray with them. And, uh, so I walked over and I said, Hey, do you mind if I pray with you? And he like looked up, both of his eyes were swollen shut. And he said, I can't see anything. So sure. <laughs> I was like, okay, well, so we prayed with I, uh, that was when I realized how much that right hook was hurting him because it completely swelled his left eye shut. Um, but you couldn't tell in the fight because there was so much blood. It looked like everything came from that first kick, you know? That's crazy. That's crazy. But again, man, another one of your finishes, which, which yeah, was my favorite. And you spoke a little bit about history. So we'll continue down that route. So born and raised in Alabama? Yep. I was born right outside of Birmingham. I was born in Birmingham, but grew up right outside of Birmingham. And then you started wrestling at, is it Gardendale? Where you were... yeah, that's right. Yeah, I started wrestling. Um, my, uh, my dad, when he was in high school, his best friend was the first ever four-time state champion in Alabama. And then uh, my dad did not wrestle, but he always talked about him. And mm -hmm. then that guy's little brother was also a four-time state champion in Alabama. And uh, kind of crazy that that guy's little brother ended up, his son was my best friend. So it was kind of uh, cool to that. Um, I just knew from an early age, as soon as I get the chance, I'm going to start wrestling because my dad would talk about those guys, you know. And to me, it just seemed like the coolest thing ever. Um, didn't know anything about it. And then they made it, when I was in middle school, they came over there and they said, hey, anybody that wants to wrestle, meet in the cafeteria. So I was pumped. And uh, got in there and uh, had no idea what was going on. They talked to us a little bit about it. And then I played football and baseball. And I, you know, I love that. And then I had my first day of wrestling practice. And I was like, oh, my gosh, this is – I always loved football because it was the hardest thing I'd ever done. 
And then my first day of wrestling practice was so much harder than any football practice I had ever had. And I like right there, I was like, this is it. This is my sport. This is what I'm hooked on, you know? Um, and uh, cause I always thought like the idea of feeling like football was tough, you know, and it was, but then to do something like wrestling, that's a different level that just, uh, it hooked me day one. Nice. Nice. And you were a three time state finalist and then won the state title your junior year at Gardendale. Yep, and I uh, <clears throat> took second my uh, sophomore year, won my junior year. My senior year, I was uh, um, kind of just walking into being a state champion. Uh, the returning uh, state champ, I beat him 17-2, to two, um, so I didn't really have any close matches all year. But the guy that was a 160-pounder, he was the number one ranked 160-pounder in the nation. Uh, and uh, But he was for our rival school that we were – our two teams were the best two in the state and he bumped up to my weight class for the state uh uh for state to try and cancel out my team points because they had a good 160 pounder to back him up and uh he beat me in the finals oh he beat ah oh, i see yeah tactics, tactics there. Fair dues. and then you went on to lindenwood uni where you yep. won the mm-hmm. naia uh, national championship yep yep mm-hmm. Nice, yeah, nice. Um, that was a it was a great experience. You know, um, you have all these men, like thoughts of what you what college is going to be like, you know, and everything for wrestling. And uh, it was I, I know a lot of people. And I, I don't mean to talk down about any colleges or anything, but I know a lot of people that go to colleges to wrestle here on the East Coast. And you know, you talk about that, talk to them like what their experience is like. But to be in the Midwest, which is like the heart of wrestling country, you know, it's like playing football in the SEC. Um, you know, you go to the Midwest to wrestle and, uh, it's just a crazy experience. You know, you're go to a tournament and I've got to wrestle. My first match is the guy from Iowa. My second match is the guy from Oklahoma. Then I got the guy from Missouri, you know, it's like every weekend is just a gauntlet of tough matches. And, um, it was great experience to do that for four years. And then you sort of started your love for for jujitsu that then came. So you tell me a bit, little bit about that, because I heard quite early on in your career, while you were a white belt, you were beating some really high level black belts in, in like local no key tournaments. How would how did BJJ get into it? So my uh, my college roommate, he was from Huntington Beach, California, and he always talked about Tito Ortiz. And uh, I had no idea about anything, really. I would heard I'd like watched one fight in uh, UFC with my dad one time. And we thought it was ridiculous, you know. And, um, so anyway, he, uh, he starts talking about Tito. I start watching videos. It was back when LimeWire was a thing, you know? So if you wanted to watch something, you downloaded it, you know? So we'd sit there and download video first, download videos, of, uh, Tito. Then I would start downloading other fights and watching them stuff. You know, I didn't watch anything live. Um, but, uh, watched a bunch of fights and then I started kind of saying, well, I think I could do this, this, this makes sense with wrestling, you know? And, um, so, well, by the time I walked into my first jujitsu practice, I had a pretty good idea of what the, all the submissions were, what not to get caught in and stuff like that. Obviously, I didn't know how to stop it, but I knew what most everything was, you know. And um, so between my junior and senior year of college, I uh, started doing some jujitsu, um, just fell in love with it. And then when I got back to college, I would try to get all the guys on my team to do jujitsu instead of wrestle with me, you know, and uh so uh, I just got, really fell in love with jiu-jitsu. Um, and after wrestling for so long, the intensity of wrestling, you always tell everybody the difference between wrestling and jiu-jitsu is if you're doing something in, rest, or in jiu-jitsu and it's not working, I say try something else. If you're trying something in jiu-jitsu or in wrestling it's not working, I say do it harder, you know. Um, so it was just really cool. It, it, as much as it's a similar sport, it is a completely different mentality. So I really fell in love with that, and uh, I just – Pretty much Alabama didn't have a lot of good jiu-jitsu guys. You know, I think there was maybe one black belt in the state of Alabama um, when I started training jiu-jitsu. Um, there was no black belts in Birmingham um, where I started training. Uh, and so I would just start trying to train with all the best people I could. Chris Howder, or not, uh, Chris Howder, Chris Moriarty at the time was a, a two-time brown belt world champ in Atlanta. So me and my buddies would drive over to Atlanta to train with him all the time. Um, and, yeah, so I uh, got to do some matches against some really good guys. Uh, it's funny, my first tournament I ever did, 
I went against Douglas Lima in the finals. And no um, <laughs> yes, so uh, that was cool. Lima was a purple belt. I was a white belt. Um, I think I, I think I beat him four to zero. Um, it was a you know tough match. Uh, and then my first fight ever, my first amateur fight, he was on the same card and making his pro debut. So that was cool. Um, and then uh, I, um, it went a couple of tournaments later. They, I, the, so my logo for my gym, my dog Deaton, he passed away now. But my uh, ex girlfriend and I were, were trying to get him. And I was like, I was broke. I had no money. Um, and I was like, I got to come up with some money for this. And there was a tournament to pay $1,000 in Atlanta if you won. So I'm like, all right, I got to win this tournament, you know? And so I go out there and there's 16 guys in the weight class and like eight of them are black belts. And it's like, oh no, I've put everything on winning this tournament. There's all these black belts. And uh, all together, I've been training jiu-jitsu uh, about six months because when I got back to college, you know, it was wrestling so much, you know? So I, even though I was trying to get everybody to jiu-jitsu with me, nobody would really do it, you know? And uh, so um, I had my first couple of matches went well. And then I had a, like a Roberto Traven black belt in the um, semifinals. And uh, I remember taking him down and landing in mount. And he threw his legs up over my shoulders. Like, I've never seen this. I don't know what to do. So I just dove off of him from mount to get away. And uh, you talk about pissing off a lot of jiu-jitsu people when you're doing that. And I have no idea what I'm doing. I just dive away from him. Um, so I ended up beating him. And then I got had Hong Carnero in the finals. Um Jacal, you know, and I, uh, I didn't know who he was. I had just gotten there and I, I was asking people, I was like, okay, who do you guys think thinks going to win this? And everybody was pointing to him. I'm like, okay, so that's my guy I got to deal with. So we get in the finals and, uh, I, uh, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking I've got to, I got to win. I got a dog to buy, you know, I can't lose this match. And yeah. my girl, only person I had with me was my girlfriend. So like, you just got to tell me the time. And, uh, so anyway, I, I take him down and I'm winning two zero the whole time. We get on the edge and I had a Brazilian referee and uh, Carnero puts his feet in my chest, pushed me off and I land in somebody's lap and he rolls up and dives on me and the ref gives him two points. And uh, uh, so it's two, two to two with like, uh, we go back to the middle and I just remember my girlfriend screaming, you have one minute, you better get up. And um, so, uh, I just exploded off bottom, took him down and passed his guard, like right at the end to win. And um, so I won, but it was just, uh, it's funny, like some going back to some of those tournaments and stuff and uh, realizing I really didn't know what I was doing, but I thank goodness I had such a strong wrestling background that I was able to, uh, to get it done, you know? Yeah. That's mad. <laughs> I love yeah, that. it's, uh, it was, uh, it's been, you know, some, some fun, fun stuff, some crazy, crazy rides, you know, and, uh, yeah. been, uh, very, very blessed through it all. Nice. Nice. And then fast forward a little bit then you, so you became a black belt and then you moved to, to, to California to the throne uh, base camp. So I'm guessing this was due to your wife's move with her job as well then. No. So my wife and I were living in Nashville. We had a fantastic fight team at Nashville MMA. I mean, Sean Hammond's there, who I got my black belt from. Love Sean. Ed Clay had the gym. Loved Ed. Um, but Ed kind of stepped away from the gym. Sean was teaching the jiu-jitsu team, but the MMA team, like, in, like, two weeks just fell apart. And a lot of the guys on our MMA team wrestled at Indiana University. So when one of them left, they just kind of all scattered. And um, so it, like, fell apart overnight. And um, so I told my wife, I was like, look, we can stay in Nashville. We love Nashville. We all have friends here in Nashville. So, but like my career moving forward for MMA is just probably not going to happen here, you know. And uh, she'd always had the dream of working in country music as a, uh, a publicist, and that's what she was doing. So, like you know, you're you're doing your thing. So, like we don't have to leave. I just probably don't get far in MMA because I really don't have anybody, you know, a lot of guys to train with. And uh, she said, no, she's like, I'm kind of getting burnt out on uh, being a publicist anyway. Um, this is, you know, not, not the job I thought it was going to be. So she said, uh, I'm going to go wherever you want. And uh, we almost moved to Portland, Oregon. I was a brown belt at the time. Um, Dethroned, was trying to get me to come out there. And then they called me and like, hey, we just fired our black belt. It's not working out. I was, you know, like I said, I was a brown belt. 
and he's like, we'll hire you um, for the salary to be our head jiu-jitsu instructor if you'll come be a part of our pro team. And uh, I said, okay, I'm in. And so that's how we ended up out there. Uh, they ended up flying Sean out about a year and a half later to give him my black belt out there. Um, so really great. Um, Jason Kraft uh, and Josh Cox checked on the gym out there. And uh, I mean, they, they were great to me. It was uh, really good. And we, but my wife and I aren't built for California. Um, it was a, uh, it was really hard on her just because people aren't nice there. You know, people aren't friendly. They don't talk to you. And my wife is a very out, uh, outgoing, friendly person. Yeah. So uh, we had some great friends, but just day to day, like you just kind of wear it. For being Southerners, you know, it wore on us. That's nothing against them. It's just as Southerners, it wore on us, you know. Yeah. Um, and so, so I told her after about two and a half years, I was like, all right, if uh, let's start working our way, figuring out how we're going to get back to, uh, to the Southeast, hopefully back to Nashville. And uh, it, it's such a God thing. Right after we had that conversation, um, the, uh, we got a call from her company saying, we're doing away with your position. We'd like to give you a raise, but we need to move you to L.A. or San Francisco. And we were both like, nope, we're not doing that. We want to get back to the Southeast. Um, and uh, they said, well, we got an option for you in Wilmington, North Carolina. And uh, so, I said, you know, you moved all the way out here uh, for me. Like, as long as there's somewhere for me to train there. We'll take it. And um, we uh, looked. Derek Brunson was here. I was like, all right, I got one person to train with. That's good. I didn't realize how many good guys there were in Wilmington. It's uh, just a lot of the guys don't train together, so it doesn't really build up the name of a place to come train. There's a lot of good guys here. And um, so that's why I ended up opening my gym, just to try and get everybody to come together. And we've been very fortunate. I uh, got you know, uh, so many of the good guys in Wilmington now train here. And uh, it was a huge blessing for me and then for everybody else that's coming up to the gym. Wow. Wow. That's it's literally so divine how that's fallen into place, really. And yeah, mm-hmm. there was nothing there that you could, you know, that you could do and you could train out of. Yeah, you created it, which is now Salty Dog, Salty Dog Gym. Um, mm-hmm. which is really good. Yeah, it's, it's been a real blessing starting out. I started, you know, the guy Corey I was talking about pretty yeah. much. I was like, hey, Corey, starting the gym. Um, I need you to come train with me, you know? And then, uh, Another guy's now one of my black belts, Brian Crandall. He was like, hey, I'm there every time you're open, or every time you guys have class, I'll be there. And so it kind of started with three of us. And um, then it, I didn't want to tell anybody at the gym I'd been training at because the last thing I wanted to do is be that guy that takes members from a gym, you know. So I didn't tell anybody. I kept training in their morning classes so they wouldn't know that I was going anywhere else because I didn't want to look like that. And um, then that gym kind of started – having problems and stuff like that so um without me telling anybody word got out that i had one and people just started coming over um and uh then it uh you know then we as we built a name people started leaving other places new people came in then i started getting people moving in from uh either out of state or you know different cities and stuff like that so it just uh it's amazing what happened uh uh with the growth of it you know and now, gosh, I think we're up to like 13 or 14 black belts, you know. Pretty impressive, that is. And, and you, you've talked about about your faith, really, and you, your follow of Jesus Christ. Uh, I am myself as well, and, and the guys that, that, that run the channel. Um, how, do, how do you implement that, you know, God, your faith? And, and, and I'm so intrigued about hearing about other believers' journeys. How do you incorporate that really into your life and, and into your, your, your craft, really, in, in MMA, wrestling, jiu-jitsu? Um, you know, I, you know, I think the one thing is like, uh, if you live it, you know, if you try to, to live it, then your life looks different, you know, so then people want to talk to you about it. And that's been really cool in the gym because I, you know, I'm a business owner, I'm not going to go out there and, and preach to guys in practice because not everybody here wants that. You know, we have people of all faiths, um, yeah. people with no faith, you know, um, so I'm not going to force that down your throat in practice, but I am going to live differently so that you, you hopefully you see something to me. But it's really cool because now I've got a good friend of mine who's a pastor. He trains here. So it's just cool how many people will come talk to me or come talk to him or um, Joe Selecki, who's you know a follower, who will come uh, talk to him about, like, hey, I've never had faith. Like, what? there's something different about you what is it that you're doing you know and um uh 
you know, I think people see a difference in mine and my wife's marriage than you see in a lot of marriages, you know, because our marriage is is built on our faith, you know. And um, so it's just kind of cool, I think, uh, for uh, the way that that works and people would just come, like, organically ask me about things, you know. That's, that's really good. Yeah, you can tell. I think you can always tell about how people live their lives, definitely. And I think it's great that there's, there's more active fighters now that are that are also, you know, brave enough to, to, to speak about their faith. So like Yoel Romero, Benil Dariush, and there's so many others really taking the opportunity. Mm-hmm. So, you no, know, we, we thank God for that. Um, just just rounding up. So we have we have like an, a skit that we do, which is quick fire questions. So I'm going to ask you, give you two options, go through them really quickly. And you just the first option that comes to your head or you agree with. You you ready for that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, firstly, wrestling or jujitsu? Preference. Oof, my goodness, uh, <laughs> jujitsu. Wrestling's too intense. I can't do. I can't handle it anymore. <laughs> coaching MMA or coaching jujitsu? Hmm. Gosh, that's a tough one. I'm going to say jujitsu just because I like to step away from the intensity sometimes. Yeah, nice. What's a better feeling, winning a fight yourself or watching one of your students win a fight? Uh, this is going to sound really selfish, but uh, I love watching people win fights, but it is nice when you win one yourself. <laughs> um, North Carolina or Alabama, which do you prefer? Mm, I love my family. I miss them a lot. I wish I saw them more, but man, North Carolina is hard to beat. I love it. It's amazing here. Cool. Uh, day out fishing or a day out with the dogs? Oof. Uh, pro- I'm going to say fishing because I get to take the dogs places all the time, but fishing's my, my main hobby. Nice. Fishing or horse riding? Fishing. My wife's the horses, I'm the fish. I like to fish. I like to ride with her, but I prefer to fish. Nice. And submission or KO victory? Oh, I wish I had KO. I just don't have the power to do it as much. So I'm going to say KO is better, but I don't get to do it that do it nearly as much. <laughs> really, really, no, that's uh, that was quite harder than <laughs> than it probably seemed at the start, but those were very intriguing answers. Appreciate that. Um, now we've also started a, a thing where we, we've we've asked fighters that we've previously interviewed to ask um, our next fighter a question, uh, and so we've got a, a question for yourself from. Um, a guy actually who's making his pro debut uh, today on Cage Warriors 155. He's a chap called Anthony Orozco from um, San Diego. He's got a wrestling background. And I will just let me just see if I can um, send you a picture of him because this is a this makes a difference in terms of what the answer will be. I'll put it in the chat here. OK, and he's a 185er. Okay. So, Anthony Roscoe, so the question from him is, would you rather fight 10 small horses or one Anthony Orozco? 10 swag? I need to know the size of these horses. Give me, I mean, we're talking about small horses like a chipmunk, or are we talking about like a duck size? We're, <laughs> we, we are talking like a chipmunk size, yeah. Uh, chipmunk size, oh, I could take, I could take 10, 10 small chipmunk size horses. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Um, and yeah, we wish Anthony all the best today. Hopefully he becomes one and in his pro career. Um, and then we'll want to ask you a question to ask the next fighter that we interview, not knowing who they will be. Most likely will be a guy, but there's a, a question that we can ask them on your behalf. Oh, man. All right. Well, I'm going to go along kind of with his question. How many five-year-olds do you think you could beat if they were all let go at the same time to come after you? Okay. <laughs> nice. I like that one. I like that one. We'll we'll get an interesting response, no doubt. I know. I, I teach the kids' classes some, and when they all jump to my back, it's hard to handle a bunch of them. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. John, you, you're doing great things, you know. I think you're a really true inspiration to, well, to myself and a lot of fighters and, and, and MMA fans across the world. Um, appreciate your time today. Um shout out your, your links where can people find you we'll, we'll put them up here on the podcast well thank you i appreciate that um um if you go to if you john salter mma on instagram i'm there um and then salty dog jiu-jitsu or port city mma um 
you know, you'll find us on any of those on uh, jujitsu and uh, uh, on Instagram and uh, Facebook. Brilliant, brilliant. John, you've, you've been so kind. Appreciate you. We'll let you go on with the rest of your day. God bless you, brother. Take All right, care. Thank you. God bless you. It's good talking to you. You too, sir. All right, gentlemen, we've been over the rules. Protect yourself at all times. I'm on the fence. I'm on the fence. We don't need to talk about that. We, 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 we. Left hook from Yaounde came and landed on him, you know, so.